Chapter 4 of Mary Carey, Frequently Martha. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jan McGillivray. Mary Carey, Frequently Martha, by Kate Langley Bosher. Chapter 4 The Stepped On and the Steppers. I don't believe I ever have written anything about my first years at this asylum. I am naturally a wandering person. Well, I was happy. I know I've said that before, but Miss Catherine says that's one of the few things you can say often. I had a kitten, and a chicken which I killed by mistake. I took it to the pump to wash it, and it lost its breath and died. I still put flowers on the place where its grave was. It was my first to die. I have lost many others since, a cat and a rabbit, and a rooster called Napoleon because he was so strutty and domineering to his wives. I didn't put up anything to his grave. I didn't think the hens would like it. They just despised him. Then there were the remains of Rebecca Baker. She was of rags, with button eyes and no teeth, just marks for them. But I loved her very much. I kept her as long as there was anything to hold her by. But after legs and arms went, and the back of her head got so thin from lack of sawdust that she had neuralgia all the time, I found her dead one morning, and buried her at once. I loved Rebecca Baker. Not for looks, but for comfort. I could talk to her without fear of her telling. She always knew how hungry I was, and how I hated oatmeal without sugar, and she never talked back. During the years from three to nine I lived just mechanical, except on the inside. I got up to a bell and cleaned to a bell, and sat down to eat to a bell, rose to a bell, went to school to a bell, came out to a bell, worked to a bell, sewed to a bell, played to a bell, said my prayers to a bell, got in bed to a bell, and the next day and every day did the same thing over to the same old bell. But when I marry my children's father, there are to be no bells in the house we live in, only buttons, with no particular time to be pressed. We go to church to a bell, too, that is, to Sunday school. We always go to St. John's Sunday school, Episcopal. The man who left this place put it in his will that we had to, but we go to all the other churches. Episcopal the first Sunday, Methodist the second, Presbyterian the third, and Baptist the fourth, and when we get through, we begin all over again. We go to church like we do everything else, two by two. Start at a tap of that same old bell, and march along like wooden figures wound up. And the people who see us don't think we are really truly children or like theirs, except in shape inside. They think we just love our hideous clothes and that we ought to be thankful for molasses and bread and milk every night in the week but one, and if we're not, we're wicked. Rich people think queer things. Sundays at the Humane are terribly religious. They begin early and last until after supper, and if anybody is sorry when Sunday is over, it's never mentioned out loud. We have prayers and Bible reading before breakfast every day but on Sundays longer. Then we go to Sunday school, where some of the children stare at us like we were foreign heathen who have come to get saved. Some nudge each other and laugh. But real many are nice and sweet, and I just love that little Minnie Dawes, who sits in front of me. She wears the prettiest hats in Yorkburg, and I get lots of ideas from them. I trim hats in my mind all the time Miss Sally is talking. Miss Sally is our teacher. She is a good lady, Miss Sally Ray is. Her chief occupation is religion, and as for going to church, it's the true joy of her life. She's in love with Mr. Benson, the superintendent, and very regular at all the services. So is he. But for teaching children, Miss Sally wasn't meant. She really wasn't. She never surely knows the lesson herself. And it was such fun asking her all sorts of questions just to see her flounder around for answers, 
that I used to pretend I wanted to know a lot of things I didn't. But I don't do that now. It was like punching a lame cat to see it hop, and I stopped. She don't ask me anything either. Never has since the day Mr. Benson came in our class and asked for a little review. And Martha Carey made trouble, of course. Miss Sally was so red and excited by Mr. Benson sitting there beside her that she didn't know what she was doing. She didn't, or she wouldn't have asked me questions, knowing I never say the things I ought. But after a minute she did ask me, fanning just as hard as she could. It was in January. Now, Mary Carey, tell us something of the people we have been studying about this winter, she said. Mention something of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Peter and Paul. Who was Abraham? Abraham was a coward, I said. A what? And her voice was a little shriek. A what? A coward. He was. He passed his wife off for his sister, fearing trouble for himself, and not thinking of consequences for her. That will do, she said and she fanned harder than ever, and looked real frightened at Mr. Benson, who was blowing his nose. Susie Rice, who was Jacob? Susie didn't know. Nobody knew, so I spoke again. Jacob was a rascal. He deceived his father and stole from his brother, but he prospered and repented, and died prominent. Mr. Benson got up and said he believed his nose was bleeding, and went out quick, and since then Miss Sally has never asked me a single question, not one. Now I wonder what made Martha speak out like that. Abraham and Jacob were good men who did some bad things, but generally only their goodness is mentioned. While you're living, it's apt to be the other way. But I'm glad the bad is overlooked in time. Maybe that is what God will do with everybody. He'll wipe out all the wrongness and meanness, and see through it to the good. I hope that's the way it's going to be, for that's my only chance. Since Miss Sally stopped asking me anything, and I her, I have a lovely time in my mind taking things off the other children and putting them on the orphans. There's Margaret Evans. In the winter she's always blue and frozen, and I'd give her that Mallory child's velvet coat and gray muff and tippet, and put Margaret's blue cape and calico dress on her. Poor little Margaret. She's so humble and thankful she gets even less than the rest it looks like. Though I suppose in clothes she has the same allowance, and the difference, maybe, is in herself. Some people are born to be stepped on, and of steppers there are always a plenty. After Sunday school we walk to the church we're going to, two by two, just alike and all in blue. The minister always mentions us in his prayers, except at St. John's, the prayer book not providing for orphans in particular. When church is over, we march home and have dinner, and after dinner we study the lesson for next Sunday and practice hymns until time for the afternoon service. That begins at four, and some of the town ministers preach or talk, generally preach, long and wearisome. The Episcopal minister gets through in a hurry. We love to have him. He talks so fast we don't half understand, and before we know it he's got his hand up and we hear him saying, and now to the Father and to the Son, and the rest is mumbled, but we know he's through and is glad of it, and so are we. The Presbyterian Sunday is the longest and solemnest and I always write a new story in my mind when Dr. Moffat preaches. He is very learned, and knows Hebrew and Latin and Greek, but not much about little girls. Poor Mrs. Blameyer. She tries to keep awake, but she can't do it, and after the first five minutes she puffs away just as regular as if she were wound up. Once I shut my eyes and tried to puff like her, but I forgot to be careful and did it so loud the girls came near getting in trouble. Dr. Moffat is deaf and didn't hear. Miss Bray heard. But the Baptist minister don't let you sleep on his Sunday. He used to try to make the girls come up and profess, 
but now he don't ask even that. Just sit where you are and hold up your hand, and when you join the church, any church will answer, you are saved. I don't understand it. We all like the Methodist minister. I don't think he knows many dead languages. He don't have much time to study, being so busy helping people. But he knows how to talk to us children, and he always makes me wish I wasn't so bad. He always does, and the merry part of me just rises right up on his Sunday, and Martha is ashamed of herself. He believes in getting better by the love way. So do I. Miss Catherine is going away next week to stay two months. Going to her army brothers first, and then to the California brother, who's north somewhere. And from the time she told me, I felt like Robinson Crusoe's daughter would have felt, if he'd had one, and gone off and left her on that desert island. I don't know what we're going to do when she goes away. I could shed gallons of tears, only I don't like tears. And then, too, she might see me. I want her to think I'm glad she's going, for she needs a change. But, oh, the difference her going will make. I will be nothing but Martha. I know it. Nothing but Martha until she comes back. The merry part of me is so sick at the thought she hasn't any backbone, and Martha is showing signs already. And that shows I'm just nothing. For Miss Catherine has taught us, without exactly telling, how we can't do what we ought by wanting. We've got to work. In plain words, it's watch and pray. And with me, it's the watching that's most important. If I'm not on the lookout, and don't nab Martha right away, praying don't have any effect. I'm a natural prayer, but on watching, I'm poor. I couldn't make anyone understand what Miss Catherine has done for us since she's been here. Some words don't tell things. The nursing when we're sick is only a part, and though she's fixed up one of the rooms just like a hospital room, with everything so white and clean and sweet in it that it's real joy to be sick, we're not sick often. It's the keeping us well that's kept her so busy. She's explained so many things to us we didn't know before. She's almost made me like my body. I didn't used to. Not a bit. It's such a nuisance, and needs so much attention to keep it going right. So often it was freezing cold, or blazing hot, or hungry, and had to be dressed in such ugly clothes that I was ashamed of it. And if ever I could have hung it up in the closet, or put it away in a bureau drawer, I would have done it while I went out and had a good time. But I couldn't do it. I had to take it everywhere I went, and until Miss Catherine came, I had mighty little use for it. But since she's been here, the girls are much cleaner, and we don't mind so much not having the things to eat that we like. That is, not quite so much, but almost. When you're downright hungry for the taste of things, it don't satisfy to say to yourself, you don't really need it, be quiet. And being made of flesh and blood, most of us would rather eat the things we want to than the things we ought to. But the dining room is much nicer. We have flowers on the table and the cooking is better, though we still have prunes. I loathe prunes. End of chapter 4 Recording by Jan McGillivray